When theater owner Larry Austin meets James Van Sickle, he thinks he's found the man of his dreams. Larry thought he was just a gift of the gods, you know. Unfortunately, not every Hollywood tale has a happy ending. At a certain point, it was clear that relations between the two became strained. This is the true story of a volatile friendship between a hustler. He had to deceive these people into believing that he actually cared for them. And a man living out his fantasies. The last thing he said to me is, God will protect me. There you are. My name is Steve Sharippa. I grew up in a pretty rough neighborhood in Brooklyn, New York. I've seen good people turn bad and bad people turn worse. Some took contracts to carry out a hit. Some were victims of a hit. To hit men, life and death is just part of the business. It's nothing personal. Hollywood, 1997. Hitman Christian Rodriguez is dressed like a villain from an old-time movie. And Lawrence Austin, an old man who loves those timeless classics, is about to die. His murder has been arranged by the young man he loves, James Van Sickle. The story of Larry Austin and James Van Sickle is a tale of two dreamers. It's a Hollywood love story and a cautionary tale. You see, you never know what a person's fantasy really is until they decide you're it. Larry longs for a beautiful young lover, but James has dreams of his own. Both their dreams come true. So why is this story a tragedy? Thank you for coming. Enjoy the show. Larry owns the Silent Movie Theater, a local landmark devoted to keeping Hollywood's history alive. Larry Austin liked being very unique. Uh, who else was doing silent films? He just loved the attention. He had many people would show up and to sit in the theater that were major stars of, of today. And he just loved that. Inside his theater, He's a living connection to those glorious days. We would have this, this routine at the, at the beginning of each evening uh, that he would come down the aisle while I played Pomp and Circumstance. He was full of Pomp and Circumstance. But then on the other hand, it reflected that he thought he was presenting something important. And he was. He was. Welcome, everyone, to the world's only silent movie theater. Larry Austin loved being a showman. He loved going in front of the audience and just talking and introducing the film. Enjoy the show. He told me that his family was involved with early Hollywood. He said his father was a character actor and his mother was the head seamstress for Cecil B. DeMille. And I thought, wow. Austin loves Hollywood traditions, like making up your own backstory. Austin says his dad was silent movie actor William Austin. Not so. And his mom, well, she never saw the stitch for Cecil B. anyone. But in Hollywood, it's all in the presentation. Act the part, and it's yours. Tonight, we're going to show Sunrise. There's only one missing piece, his very own leading man. One night, he appears, Larry's Nighthawk in shining armor, James Van Sickle. Larry Austin first met James through a mutual friend. When Larry asked for help to, to paint the theater, he uh, brought James along. Here is this great big guy who probably was Stanley stunning when he went to the gym every day. Broad shoulders and big arms, handsome face, all American boy, but large economy size, you know. James reminded me like of a, of a country boy, you know, uh, a farm boy. Um, he was always smiling, kind of giving everyone the once over. 
He was such a flirt. He was a flirt with apparently everybody. James Van Sickle might not be everybody's idea of a dreamboat, but he is Larry's. Larry told me, looked at him, said, wow, he'd like to have him. He's such a hunk. What else can There may be some guys whose heads are returned by a beautiful creature who is 40 years younger. Larry Austin is not one of them. Larry's a lonely 67-year-old man. James is a 27-year-old ex-con hustler looking for a sugar daddy. Cupid, draw back your bow. It in a way is touching because at this stage, James would have had a hard time making it as a hustler because he was too out of shape, you know. It took somebody with the loneliness and the passion and the imagination to still see him as Hercules, let's say. Larry Austin's dreams are coming true. With his new boy toy, it looks like he really has it all. His first passion, the silent movie theater, doesn't make Larry a fortune, but he loves the work. He'd had hundreds of old silent movie reels. Some of them were uh, original, one of a kind, uh, on the old celluloid. It's a very beautiful art form that you have to express this and that with your hands, your eyes, gestures. Some things are much more powerful if they're revealed by an image than a word. Larry Austin had the great joy of, of acquiring a library, building that library up, building, building, building. And he loved finding the rarest titles he could find and showing them to the audience. He, he just loved that. Larry Austin's uh, first touch into you know, showing silent films to an audience was at the Mormon church. And he just enjoyed it so much. At the beginning, James Van Sickle is just what a crumbling old theater needs. He could do things that Larry could not do. Larry did not like to get his hands dirty. James was great to handle things that uh, needed to be taken care of. James, this is wonderful. What could be better than a helpful hunk? I mean, it was a strong sexual attraction, and Larry thought he was just a gift of the gods, you know. It doesn't take Larry long to decide James would be great around the house, too. James. It was just, just a relationship of, 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 of lust. You're smelling good. Here is a much younger guy who had done some hustling and had latched on to this much older man who had fallen hard for him. And it's, it's a classic recipe for big trouble. Larry has no idea who he's lured into his bedroom. His young lover is fresh out of the pen. Six years for beating an older gay lover half to death. This was a, another elderly gentleman, very similar to Lawrence Austin, wealthy, uh, gay. He took uh, James in and bought him everything, you know, that he had want, treated him very well. One day, James got angry at something that this victim had said and uh, went into his room and hit him in the head with a hammer. He put out at some level sexually to these guys to satisfy them and to draw them into a relationship with him and apparently succeeded quite well. And yet at the same time, he entertained a secret hatred in his first ever interview, James reveals what he really thinks about old gay men who put the moves on young guys. Well, I think they're all scum, okay? They're scum of this earth, and I would try to win their trust, 
all right, to a certain extent to where I could get within their residence, you know, get them alone to where I could do what I felt I needed to do to them in order to punish them. For now, Larry's ignorance is bliss. Larry loved to do for James, as Mae West would say, you know, doing for him. He just idolized him and whatever he could possibly do, you know, buying types of foods that he liked, he was always thinking of something to get James. And I thought, oh boy, you know, he's in love. James, in, in, in the relationship with Larry, was very dominant. Larry liked that. He liked someone strong around him. People like Austin want to have people like James sort of dominate them sexually. James had to provide that level of sexual service to keep a guy like Austin on the hook. Is James as into Larry as much as Larry lusts for James? Not really. James doesn't see his involvement with Larry as a relationship. It's a job. He acts like a loving partner, and in exchange, he gets a nice lifestyle and some cash in his pocket. There's a word for what James is doing. So Hustling is the politest one. James is good at it. How good? Well, Larry will never know. But James isn't even gay. When I would ask him, did he enjoy this, it was clear he did not. He comes across to me as a straight guy. He professes personally to be offended at gayness, and yet he engages in it. It's almost like he's outside of the relationship. He sees the relationship, but he's personally removing himself at a distance from it. He's not accepting that him and Austin were partners, for example, sexually or personally. But when you get closer and say, you know, what about how did you did you hug? Did you love? I mean. There's a rejection by James to me of all that. It's, I'm just like you, I'm a, I'm a studly guy. James Van Sickle is not at all whom he appears to be. Larry Austin's been making pillow talk with a time bomb. Friday, January 17, 1997. Hollywood silent movie theater is playing Sunrise a romantic drama built around a murderous plot. Hitman Chris Rodriguez is at the theater to turn a real love story into a real murder. It's not how a romance is supposed to end, with a hired killer. Rewind seven years, and Larry really believes his boy toy loves and admires him. He thinks James shares his passion for old movies. It's an act. He had no interest in film whatsoever. He pretended like he liked the silent movies, and he, liked, he had a love for the film. And he played to Mr. Austin's vast ego. He liked to think that he knew everything about silent movies and even some of the stars. He said he had met some of the stars, Mary Pickford and I think Buster Keaton and some of the other silent movie people. He liked to think of himself as a, of a connoisseur. Stroking egos is child's play for any hustler. What's hard for James is taking orders. He's working at the theater, and Larry's the boss. James, we have some problems. When James was working in the theater, it was Larry was in charge. I mean, it, he, it was his show place. Everything went by Larry. Larry's not so good on the labor relations front. For one thing, he doesn't pay James, treats him like a kid gives him spending money and presents. Larry expects James to be happy with this arrangement, to love him for his firm but kindly ways. Yeah, well, Larry's in dreamland. If he woke up, 
he might see the writing on the wall. Austin was a control freak, and he liked to keep Van Sickle controlled. He would give him just enough money to exist on, but never enough to really do anything with. You'll be paid. If you're starting to think Larry's got blinders on, you're dead right. He thinks all James needs is some firm guidance. <sighs> There's a big problem with treating James Van Sickle like a kid. I mean, he's the last person on earth you want to remind of his childhood. He started out in Nebraska, a great place, unless you're poor and not even your family wants you. You see, James isn't living his dream, not even close. He's running from his nightmare. James grew up in a, in a troubled household, shall we say. Uh, his earliest memories are of, of severe beatings and mistreatment. He was made to feel ultimately like he was undesired. When his mom and dad split up and mom remarries, life gets way worse. His new stepfather has his own kids and the blended family is toxic. James tells us, what that was like. My early childhood was very, very difficult. We were, you know, extremely poor people, and so there was a little bit of sibling disparity. Someone has to go, and it's James. It was a, it was a heart wrenching moment. Uh, I remember everybody was crying, and I was shaking like a leaf. It terrified me. And I was begging not to go. I blame myself for letting him go. I shouldn't have let him go. James is handed off to a Christian home for kids whose parents don't want or can't afford them. But the kids there don't learn to fear God nearly as much as they live in terror of the people who work there. We thought they were such good people, and these people were molesting my son. There was six perversions that went on, okay? It first began with the oral population. Um, it wasn't until my 13th year was when he started going in a different direction. This guy was a monster. And uh, there was no way you could escape him at my age. These people were supposed to be Christian people, and they weren't. You don't do this to children. James is 10 when he's put in the children's home. He's 15 when he gets out. Now, those are important years for a kid. And for all of them, he is a sexual plaything for one of the authority figures there. So when other kids are learning the three R's, James is learning that if you satisfy someone's lust, they treat you better. And all you lose is your innocence and your dignity. He was out of control, he was wild, he was just, I mean, just like something would trip his mind and he would lose it. As soon as he's old enough, Van Sickle joins the Marines. He's angry and unstable. He said in the Marines that there was people that were the same as, as his molester. He soon discharged and ends up on the streets of L.A. The only real skill he's got is what he learned in that children's home. You can trade your body for a meal and a warm bed. James Van Sickle becomes a hustler. He was doing sexual favors with men to survive. To survive? or to take revenge. That older gay lover he beat up wasn't the only one. A great many hustlers start out as straight, but because they are straight, they get confused because the John is the only one who is really showing them affection. 
and they can build up a great deal of anger and resentment and frustration. What is a hustler, really? I've known quite a few over the years. I'll tell you, they're stick-up artists whose weapon is charm. They convince you that you want to give them what they're demanding. James as a person just rubbed me the wrong way. And I can tell a user right from the get-go, uh, someone that looks like he's going to be scamming somebody. And he just came off that way, that he was just out for himself. And watch out. After two years with Larry Austin, James' biggest beef is he's still not getting paid. James, what are you doing? He solves that with direct action. Just uh, getting a little fine. At a certain point, it was clear that relations between the, the two became strained, and it was over money. Love of money, the root of all evil. But James Van Sickle isn't the only one in this odd couple romance with the shady past. Larry spent a couple of years in the pen himself. Wait a second. Larry's an ex-con, too? As a matter of fact, he is. It's part of his real backstory. You see, before he reinvents himself as a Hollywood aristocrat, Larry Austin is an accountant who has a habit of pocketing other people's money. A habit that lands him two years for embezzlement. Does Larry reform in prison or just get more clever? And how did he come to own the silent movie theater in the first place? It was owned by a little old lady. Somehow, Larry gets her to hand over the keys. Larry Austin, there was a shady element to him. I think there was some stretching of the truth on a lot of things of how he got her to sign it over to him. If it was a scam, he got away with it. Now he's the keeper of Hollywood's history. He's a prosperous businessman. Larry's good at getting what he wants, and keeping his young lover happy doesn't seem too hard. Larry and James, two hustlers chasing their dreams. With this one. How could that lead to conflict? Good. Larry gives James a cushy life and a new truck. What more could he want? Problem. This life comes with strings. The truck is in Larry's name. When James cuts those ties and gets himself a real job, he does pretty well. He was well liked, he was making decent money, he was well thought of as a worker. He manages a small lighting factory. He hires a guy named Christian Rodriguez to do the shipping. Remember Chris, we haven't seen the last of him. Rodriguez was a poor kid who was a little bit slow. He was just a simple person. He was married, he had children. Putting lamps in boxes is a little too complicated for Chris. He gets fired. Yeah, four again, what's up? Great. All the while, Larry's been enticing James to come back to the theater. He finally gets his way by offering him a share of the business and the job of projectionist. James tries to control his temper. It can't last. I tried for several years to maintain. I would totally destroy personal property. I mean, it was like a tug of war type thing with me. Larry called me and said, oh, Michael, James is acting up again. I said, what's wrong? He said, oh. He, 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 he said that he wanted money, and he said if he didn't, he was going to break things. What are you doing? You're destroying my treasure. You animal. You animal. If Larry is still thinking James is his dream come true, he's got some issues of his own. And if he thinks his patience is the solution to Van Sickle's anger, 
He's not a dreamer. He's delusional. It's a fine line, but crossing it can get you hurt. What begins as a normal evening at Hollywood's silent movie theater is soon going to be very unsilent, thanks to the 357 that first-time hitman Christian Rodriguez has brought to the show. In fact, Rodriguez will be the show, and the audience will never forget it. Before that fateful night, James Van Sickle and Larry Austin are lovers who are heading in different directions. Larry's in love. Trouble is, his young lover is scarred and damaged, and Larry is rubbing salt in his wounds. James thought he had found himself a sugar daddy, but the taste has gone bitter. They've been together six years now. A long, bumpy road. The relationship was disintegrating him at this point. Larry had turned him down for some hunk of money. I was standing outside of the theater once um, before the show, and he came out. He seemed to be very angry, mad at Lawrence. And he said something to the effect that, well, that old man better watch out because he may wind up dead one day. James was a person that you would definitely keep arm's length at. I mean, he was friendly, but again, when you talk to him more, he revealed a little bit of a sociopathic streak that you would say, is he really kidding or is he serious about what he's saying? And you would, wouldn't want to get too friendly with him. Larry! I want my money! But he recruits a couple of thugs to help him rob the theater. Robbie, James, come back. James really became unsettling when he attempted to rob the theater. That was really out there and scary. James clearly has problems with impulse control, but he isn't stupid. He comes back contrite and with a peace offering. The other guys made me do it, he says. Larry buys it. No, no. The bad guys force James to rob the silent movie theater? I mean, how likely is that? You may not believe it, but Larry does, or he pretends to. That way, the whole conflict could get swept under the rug. Denial. It can be a fatal disease. How do you like that, eh? Larry really was in love with him, and he was looking for ways to forgive him, too. I mean, it was very sad and complicated and volatile, volatile, volatile. It was definitely like a moth going to a flame. He just couldn't stay away. Austin found James compelling enough to keep him around, even though he was smelling the danger. Tells you there's something going on here at a, at a sexual, emotional level that's not easy to unwind. Be a star. To calm the waters, Larry surprises James with what he's always dreamt of, financial security. He writes a will naming James as his sole heir. The theater and film archive are worth a million dollars. Austin must have felt that kind of emotional warmth towards James. Uh, how else do you envision him wanting to give what remained of his, uh, you know, his, his financial empire to James upon his demise. Trouble is, to James, Larry is now worth more dead than alive. Obviously, this was not uh, well considered, for sure. Hey, good, good morning, morning James. How are you? By morning, Larry realizes he's made a bad move. Uh, that will. Let me keep it somewhere safe. <laughs> it's safe? Right here. Austin's decision to put James on the will is what probably triggered James into thinking, now I can, now I can take advantage of this guy fully the way I really want to. It might have been his death knell. 
it was the culmination of a lot of effort by James to get there and that success at seeing himself now empowered financially by Austin let him begin thinking, now I can get rid of this guy. For Larry Austin, when the excitement sim is down, he relaxes. Everything's back to normal. Only Larry's normal is James's living hell. With the will in his pocket, the brakes are off on James's rage. You're a fool! I'm tired of it! That garbage son of a... Finally, one night, they got into this heated, heated fight, and James had taken a, a phone cord and wrapped it around his neck, and Larry thought he was going to die. I did almost kill him, kind of put the brakes on what I really wanted to do to this person. It's hard to explain what goes through my mind. What doesn't go through his mind is that physically attacking someone is a crime. It's called assault. Larry calls the cops, but then drops the charges. I said, you know, I'm beginning to worry about this situation, Larry. You know, I'm, you know, I'm beginning to get afraid for you. This is not good, and you really need to take steps to protect yourself. Larry didn't want to recognize the really true danger that he was in that was escalating by the minute. He said to me, as God will protect me. James is now afraid that last attack might have scared Larry into dumping him. He's got to act fast. Panic. That's how a hustler with a violent temper becomes a guy who can plot a cold-blooded murder. So James decides Larry Austin needs to die. That way, he'll get everything he needs from him. Vengeance and a small fortune. He decides a robbery gone bad is the way to go. And he won't do it himself. He'll hire a hitman. But who can he recruit to pull the trigger? Who's desperate enough to kill an old man for cash? How about the dim bulb from the lighting store? Chris Rodriguez? He's got a family to feed and no marketable skills. Perfect. I don't know if you could say I snapped, is that I had a, a desire, an overwhelming desire to punish Lawrence Austin, okay? And uh, I began talking about it to friends, you know, anybody that would listen, I would, uh, man, I hate this person, man, this person's a scumbag. He does a lot more than call them bad names. He gives Rodriguez a detailed plan. Van Sickle told him almost everything to do. And whatever Van Sickle would tell Christian to do, that's what Christian would do. James told Christian, look, you know, if we get this to happen, we're both going to be in, in clover. I'm going to have all this money, and, and you'll be my sidekick, and we'll, we'll go through life uh, much better off than we are now. So Larry Austin, the keeper of Hollywood's history, is about to become part of it, a real-life tragedy, just a few blocks south of the boulevard of broken dreams. Rodriguez had no criminal history, but once Van Sickle planted that seed into him with the money, it just ate him up until he decided to go ahead and kill for it. So, Chris Rodriguez sees his dream coming true. Before, he couldn't hold on to a job. Now all he's got to do is kill a guy and he's on easy street. For most people, this is where your conscience or your better judgment would kick in and say, whoa, this is wrong. This is a bad idea. Doesn't happen. My sense of Rodriguez is he just never really gave this the kind of thought it needed. How would he have ever envisioned himself succeeding at this process? I see Chris Rodriguez as an incredibly weak-minded individual. Larry Austin could see what's coming. His dream 
crumbling into a nightmare. Larry had told me, like, uh, probably about two weeks or three weeks before he was murdered, that um, he was frightened of James, and he said that he has had a cell phone now because he was afraid that James was going to be cutting the phone wires and Larry couldn't call for help. He told me that anything happened to him, point the finger at James. Now that he has a plan, James doesn't mind pretending to be the obedient boy taught, so he keeps a lid on his temper. This real estate will soon be his, and he'll be rich. And that powerful exploiter, Larry Austin, he soon will get what he deserves. Enjoy the show. He's a scumbag, OK? And I knew I couldn't do it, OK? I mean, if I did it, everybody would know. I thought about doing something, you know, in the theater, doing it dramatic, all kinds of things. Van Sickle's actually gone way further than just musing about it. He's justified to himself that Larry deserves to die. His true goal is an avenging angel kind of attitude towards people like Austin for the purpose of paying back for the past history in his own life. James picks Friday, January 17th, 1997 as the day for Larry to be killed. It'll be busy and Austin will be distracted. On Tuesday, he goes over the plan with Chris Rodriguez. The hitman will act like he's robbing the place. Rodriguez gets a gun, no money. It was almost unbelievable that he would have done this with nothing down. And he thought, honestly, that Van Sickle was going to pay him. I said, so in other words, you did all this on credit. You, you did this all on credit. Three nights later, Chris Rodriguez heads to the theater. This is the whole theatrics of, 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 and the dynamics of how Van Sickle was. He was a control person also. And he wanted this to be dramatic. And he thought if he wears all dark clothes, maybe he can get away easier. People won't recognize him as quick. We started the show as usual. Uh, he would come down. We did Pomp and Circumstance, and he introduced the show. Lawrence Austin welcomes the silent movie audience for the, world. For the very last time. Tonight, Larry Austin will fall victim to a masterpiece of foolishness. Chris Rodriguez isn't playing out some twisted dream of his own. He's a simpleton, and he's got a simple plan. He's going to kill old guy, get money, feed kids. James Van Sickle is more complicated, but his judgment is clouded. He's so angry, he can't see Larry isn't really the guy who hurt him. And Larry Austin, well, he thinks everything's great. Three people, three distorted views of reality. That's how dreams become nightmares. We went through the first uh, short and then we went into the second movie, which was called School Days, and it was a uh, comedy starring Larry Seaman. Rodriguez has never shot anyone. It's his debut, and he's got stage fright. I was very nervous that at one time he got up, he went into the restroom, and he was sweating a little bit. He didn't know if he was going to go through with it, but then he started thinking about his wife and his kids. He didn't have any diapers and no money. And that pushed him over to make him go ahead and do it. Got up, he went to the candy counter. I, I, I need to see your manager. He said he wanted uh, to buy a, a block of tickets for a future performance. And about that same time, Mr. Austin uh, walked up to the counter. Yes, sir. How can I help? 
And then that's when Rodriguez pulled the gun and demanded the money. There you are. What? Mr. Austin complied, absolutely started rounding up the money, putting it in a paper bag, and Rodriguez kind of leaned over the counter, got a little closer, pointed the gun straight out as far as he could, right up to Austin's head. Hurry up! <laughs> Larry Austin thinks he's being robbed. It's his last delusion. Lawrence Austin loves silent movies. He loves living in their dreamy world. And when he dies, it's just like one of them. Not a word, all action. Tonight, inside a theater in Hollywood, there'll be a murder that will end several dreams. It won't be on the screen, and it won't be silent. Hurry up! <laughs> From five feet, you could miss if you're nervous. Two inches, five inches, right in the head, you're not gonna miss. It was more important that he had diapers and rent than Mr. Austin had a life. At that point, he became a stone cold killer. The script says no witnesses. Too bad for ticket girl, Mary Giles. He turned to Mary and shot her point blank. <laughs> Miraculously, her wound is not fatal. I believe it was God's miracle. Just a twist of her body, a certain centimeter or an inch or, you know. I heard a series of, of uh, pops coming from the lobby. And I had thought that someone was firing off firecrackers. And so I had turned around and I stopped playing. I heard uh, a few more pops and then I see a man running down this aisle, shooting, shooting over his head, just shooting wildly. He ran down an alley and to his car, which he had parked a couple blocks away. After he went out the back door, I ran up to the lobby, and that's where I saw Mary. And there was Lawrence there, and he was shot through the eye. John Miller is the first detective on the scene. Now, originally, we thought it was a robbery. I had all the signs of robbery with the money, with the victim being shot behind the counter. The strange thing about it was he was shot point blank. I mean, obviously killed him instantly, but then he was shot twice more in the leg, uh, which didn't quite make sense to us. I want to help. The projectionist seems eager to help. He told us that, you know, he was in the projection booth. He heard the shots. He pushed the alarm, uh, but he didn't see anything. By the time he said, by the time he got out, everything was over. But he does hold something back. He didn't mention anything about the relationship with, the, with uh, Austin. He just said they were good friends and that he admired him because they both had this love for silent movies. Even though he apparently hated us enough to want him to die, he, he tried to manipulate this into a situation where it appeared that he was an innocent uh, witness to this terrible crime and not the perpetrator. An hour or so after the murder, uh, James had come up to me and said, we, we need to reopen this theater and run it as Lawrence had always run it before. And well, it'll be you and me, Dean. And uh, which I thought was kind of strange to say that since his lover had just been murdered. At Larry's funeral, James acts as a pallbearer. It's the end of a great era. I mean, we, we lost an individual that was dedicated to preserving the silent movies, the, the birth of the industry, and um, he's gone. The next day, when Detective Miller searches Austin's apartment, he finds the will. We thought, well, that's kind of strange that he would write a will, and then it would be in a computer, 
and he would leave everything to Van Sickle, who at that time we only knew as just his projectionist. So the cops have their suspicions about James Van Sickle, but nothing really to go on. The real break comes when Mary Giles describes the shooter to a police sketch artist. She's got an eye for detail, that girl, I'll tell you. This sketch is so dead on that as soon as it hits the papers, Chris Rodriguez's own relatives call the cops. At Chris's place, they find evidence that ties him to James. Rodriguez confesses in a heartbeat, James is arrested, and Detective Miller's dream comes true. What do detectives dream about? Cases that solve themselves. Our investigation determined that Van Sickle, who was designated as the sole beneficiary of Mr. Austin's estate, which is valued in excess of $1 million, hired Rodriguez to kill Austin for approximately $25,000. When James was arrested, I was shocked and I just felt tremendous sadness all around. I felt sad for him, sad, sad for Larry, sad for the theater, sad for the patrons. Both men are found guilty of murder. But when the jury hears what James Van Sickle's childhood was like, they take pity on him. Him and Chris Rodriguez are spared the death penalty. They both get life without parole. To this day, Van Sickle says he's innocent. Never, never did it. I did not hire this guy to do it. No one believes him, which is why he's speaking to us now from a California prison. James Van Sickle's mother serves her own life sentence, thinking of how different things could have been. I think he was a victim of his mind. He had so much anger that um, he was hurting people. I just want some peace for my son. There's little chance of that. Sorry as you might feel about a guy's lost youth, it's no excuse for cold-blooded murder. Larry Austin did not deserve to die. He brought a lot of happiness to people, and I, I think Larry would be appreciative that a lot of people can walk away and say they were glad that Larry ran the silent theater.